Good afternoon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to a talk organized by the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Mrs. Eva Derman, the president of the Society, who will introduce today's lecturer and her topic. Thank you, Pavla. Um, as Pavla mentioned, um, my name is Eva Derman, and I am the president of the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews. The Society was formed in 1961, and its primary mission was to propagate and preserve the history and culture of Jews who have lived in the territory defined by the boundaries of the first Czechoslovak Republic. Since 2011, with the cooperation of Czech and Slovak governmental and immigrant organizations in New York, we organize public events such as lecture series, individual talks, book launches, and film showings. Most of our activities took place at the Bohemian National Hall in New York, some at the Leo Beck Institute and at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. Our events in the last 10 years were too numerous to mention here. So please look for them at our website. And if I can have the next slide. And so here is our website. The website was constructed by our newest board member, Pavla Rosenstein, it's beautiful. And if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, please contact us and here is our email. Uh, thanks to Pavla Iklova, our much esteemed board member, we remained active during the pandemic through Zoom. We will be continuing with the lecture series, literature and by and about Czech and Slovak Jews in the fall. This lecture series is in part supported by the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs and SVU, Spoločnost Prevedu a Umenie, is a co-organizer of this series of lectures. In October, Veronika Takerova from Harvard will present a lecture inspired by Franz Kafka's writings. Then later in December, we will be hosting Charles Sabotosh from Yeditepe University in Istanbul, who will be talking about an early 20th century Slovak writer, Geza. Another major function of the society is to commemorate Czechoslovak Jewish victims of the Shoah. To this end, the society has been conducting in New York every year since 1948 a memorial service. For the last 10 years, this service has been held at the Bohemian National Hall in New York. During the Holocaust, Germans and their collaborators killed approximately 263,000 Jews who resided in the territory of Czechoslovak Republic in 1938. First Czechoslovak Republic. Slovakia was the first Axis partner to consent to the deportation of its Jewish residents in the framework of the final solution. According to a census of December 1940, there were about 90,000 Jews in Slovakia. German and Slovak authorities deported from Slovakia more than 70,000 Jews. The Germans murdered more than 60,000 of them. Who was deported 
and who was not, was to a large extent dependent on Josef Tissa, the president of the Slovak state between 1939 and 1945. As a child of Slovak, Holocaust survivors, I am particularly grateful that Madeleine Vatkerti will talk to us about the letters Slovak Jews sent to Josef Tiso begging for their lives. Um, Madeleine Vatkerti is an American currently living in Slovakia, in Bratislava. She has an impressive career behind her. She worked for several years in the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies and the Office of the Chief of Staff at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. She also worked at Advocates for Survivors of Torture and Trauma, a DC-based nonprofit that provided services for asylum seekers from over 80 countries. To top her impressive career, she's currently pursuing a PhD in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, can be on the next side, at Graz College in Philadelphia, where she is a Samuel P. Mandel Fellow. She can be contacted by email, and here is her email address. Based on her research in Slovak National Archives, she recently published a book in Slovak, Slovotny Pan President, as she translates it, Your Honor, Mr. President, this book is available for purchase through the publisher Absent. Madeline goes with her book to high schools, cultural centers, TV programs. She's on the radio talking about a topic that is still somehow a taboo in Slovakia. But despite of that, her book has been very well received and is now in second printing. The Slovak newspaper Prouda put her book as number eight of published books in 2020. And she got a big prize, book number one from Pantare for nonfiction. I'm glad that Madeline is here with us to tell us about her book and the period of history that was the most traumatic for Jews in Slovakia. This period shaped lives of not only of the survivors, but also of their children. The survivors lost most of their families. After the war, many took on new surnames, attempting to suppress or hide their origins. Right now, the book is available only in Slovak and it can be purchased. And as I understand, English translation is in preparation. Madeline, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that really lovely introduction. I'm very grateful for the invitation. This is the first time I've ever presented information about my research in the United States in English. And I'm very excited. And I'm very excited that uh, you all are here to listen and uh, learn what I've learned in the Slovak National Archive doing my research. Uh, let's go to the next. My research uh, began when I work at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. The museum decided to send me to Slovakia to look in the archive and find documentary evidence about the Holocaust there that the museum would then copy and make available for future researchers. It was, it was part of a worldwide project and people from the museum went all over the world looking for this evidence and copying it. It was a multi-year 
project and I was delighted to be a part of it. Uh, one of the times when I was there, I found some letters that were written to Joseph Tiso and we'll talk about him in a second but I couldn't put the letters out of my mind because they were very dramatic and very personal. Uh, they were, there were so many letters about the Jewish, so-called Jewish question in Slovakia, and each one was different and they were very dramatic. And I told myself that as soon as I was able, I would go back over there on my own and do a little bit of research and see what's really in those letters and see what could be learned from them. I honestly thought that it was a personal project for personal interest, but I had no idea what I was walking into. There was so much interest in the letters that I had found that when I started talking about them, I started to get a lot of requests uh, from media and from people, from groups of people who were just very interested in finding out what was in the letters. At first, I, um, I thought that the letters would be the absolute focus of my research, but then I noticed that the files that the letters were in were also fascinating because they gave me in more information about the letter writer and they gave me more information about how their letter was being processed and the kind of responses that people were getting from the president's office. And then I realized that in certain situations, in many situations, the district office where the letter writer lived also had a file on the person. So I started going to district offices and looking in their files. They didn't have photocopiers in those days. So correspondence would be sent back and forth. And by putting the two sets of files together, I could draw up a more complete picture about the person. And then I decided I wanted to find out what happened to the people who wrote to Tiso to ask him for help. And I started using tracing services, uh, Jewish genealogical websites. And sometimes it was enough just to Google the person and I would be able to, in many cases, find out what happened to the person and whether they survived or not. And uh, the results that I came across, I just wanted to warn you that uh, the results that I found are very disturbing and very upsetting. So that you're prepared for some of the things I'm going to tell you this evening. It's impossible to talk about the whole of Slovak history with you this evening. And uh, I will, but I'll just give you a few things about the Holocaust in Slovakia that were unique and talk to you about this man, Josef Tiso. The Slovak Republic was established in March 1939 as a byproduct of Germany's aggression against Czechoslovakia. Uh, it was not occupied by Nazi troops until the autumn of 1944. Until that point, as a Nazi client state, all anti-Semitic measures, including legislation and policies, were carried out by the Slovak government on its own initiative and using its own administrative resources. The second point I would make is that the state claimed that its persecution of Slovak Jews was in complete and total alignment with church teachings. Catholic Clergymen were very prominent in the political arena and various levels of public life as well. I was fascinated by the fact that uh, Tiso was a Catholic priest. And, and thirdly, the state's anti-Semitic legislation, including its most radical legal norms, always allowed for exemptions. However, there's not a lot of evidence in the archives that there were many exemptions. And there's an American historian named James Ward who decided to look at every single box. There are 263 boxes in this record group and count the exact number of exemptions that were given out. And the number he came up with, he used all kinds of statistical tables and census records was 922 which uh, is not a lot. 95% of the applications for exemptions from Jewish legislation were turned down. And most of the people who received exemptions 
were necessary for the state economy because they had specific necessary skills and not for humanitarian reasons. Uh, during the existence of the Slovak state, Jews could seek protection under no fewer than 18 different kinds of exemptions. And it's, it's a very complicated matter. Uh, not enough time to really talk about it with you here. So who was Joseph Tiso? Josef Tiso. He was the president of the Slovak state from 1939 to 1945. And he was a Roman Catholic priest. And there's a lot of controversy around him. Uh, and it's a topic that would take uh, many hours to discuss with you. But for now, I will read a quote to you that he made in Holich in Slovakia in 1942 in support of the deportations. People ask whether what is being done with the Jews is Christian. Is it humane? Is it not robbery? I ask, is it Christian when the nation wants to free itself from its eternal enemy, the Jew? Love of self is a command from God. And this love of self commands me to remove everything that damages me or that threatens my life. I don't think I need to convince anyone that the Jewish element threatened the lives of Slovaks. It would have looked even worse if we hadn't pulled ourselves together in time, if we hadn't purged them from us. And we did so according to divine command. Slovak, cast off your parasite. He makes it very clear. And there were a lot of conversations with people from the Vatican who were not pleased with what he was doing. And uh, he made this speech when people had started to indicate they were a little bit concerned about what was how the Jews were being treated. In the beginning, uh, the, when Jews, Jewish property was being taken away from their owners, people were pleased because they thought that this would even out some economic disparities in the society. But it turned out quite differently. Um, on April 5th, 1947, the Czechoslovak National Court, Narodny Sud, sentenced Tiso to death and hanged him for state treason betrayal of the anti-fascist partisan insurrection and collaboration with Nazism. And with that, let's go to the next slide. I have just a couple of quick definitions for you so that you'll understand the reasons why people wrote to Tiso. The um, word Aryanization is the totally legal transfer of Jewish property into non-Jewish hands. The image you see on the screen is a picture of a Jew who uh, is taking advantage of the Slovak people. And the words say that the anger of the people toward uh, profit eaters is probably the best translation I can come up with for that word. Um, but the word for eater is the word that's used for animal eating not people eating, and he's eating flour and coffee and basically coming by what he has at the expense of the Slovak people. So when you hear the word Aryanization, you'll know what's going on. And I have a letter for you from an Aryanizer, somebody who wanted to Aryanize a Jewish property that we'll read in a bit. The other uh, detail information that I wanted to provide to you is about the Jewish code, the Zhidovsky Codex from September 9th. This was a very harsh 270 paragraph decree that stripped Jews of any remaining civil and human rights they still had. It defined Jewishness on the basis of racial criteria. The most cruel aspect of the law was that Jews needed to wear a yellow star of David on their clothes. Freedom of assembly, freedom of movement uh, were all forbidden. Public spaces were forbidden, like restaurants, parks, movie theaters, and contact with Aryans was also forbidden. Jews could not have driver's licenses, stamp collections, typewriters, radio, telephones, photographic equipment, bicycles, antiques, hunting, fishing gear. And basically, the purpose of the law, aside from taking away Jew Jewish rights and property, was to humiliate the Jewish population and isolate them from the rest of society. Paragraphs 255 and 256 of the code gave Tiso the power to grant exemptions. 
The exemptions could be permanent or temporary. They could be partial. They could be full. And they were, they cost money. And uh, TISO was the person who set the fee, uh, how much a person should pay. And that fee was usually based on the recommendation of the district office where the person lived. So uh, here's a photo from Yad Vashem of what the Jewish badge looked like. Roughly 20,000 letters, maybe more, were written by Jews and non-Jews to Tiso about the so-called Jewish question. They're personal, they're emotional, people poured their hearts out to him. You will see in one of the letters a very emotional, obsequious request. Each letter shows how the author was affected by anti-Semitic legislation as an individual. And the letters came from the entire country, men, women, Men were the higher percentage of letter writers, maybe 95, 96% of letters came from men. The youngest author I found so far is a five-year-old and the oldest uh, is 89. Um, I say so far because I'm, I, now that the archives are opening again after COVID, I'd like to get back in there and look at more letters. The letters fall into four categories. Sometimes they were from Jews asking for help, uh, usually so that they could keep their businesses or their property, their personal property, uh, furs, um, radios. Uh, uh, it was different, different for every single person. Then there were Jews who wanted exemptions, which is what I talked about a little bit earlier. Then there were non-Jews who wrote saying that the Aaronization process was corrupt and they wanted to know what happened and why they didn't get the Jewish property. And you'll, I have a letter from someone to share with you this evening. And then there were non-Jewish public servants who were married to Jews. And according to the Jewish code, they were supposed to lose their jobs. I know that you really don't wanna hear me. You wanna hear what's in these letters and I wanna share it with you. I thought they would look a little bit better on the PowerPoint than they do, but you can still see something. At least you can see what it looked like when I was holding it in my hands. Tibor B was a 31 year old Jewish man who lived with his mother in Spiska Nova Ves, which is, I think, about 200 kilometers away from Bratislava. It's in the east. And he could not walk. He had had an accident, and both of his legs had been operated on. And he was mostly confined to his apartment. And he wanted to be allowed to keep his radio. And I'll read the letter and then I'll tell you what I learned about his fate. October 12th, 1941. Your Honor, Mr. President, permit me to kindly, as a faithful, loyal, and devoted citizen of the state and its president, Your Honor, Mr. President, on the occasion of your approaching and celebrated birthday, in the most humble and devoted way, I most sincerely congratulate you. May the Almighty God preserve you for many, many years in complete and continuous physical and spiritual health so that you can serve your high function vigorously and build this country to the delight of its citizens. On this occasion, I take the liberty of presenting to you, your honor, Mr. President, my earnest, fervent, and modest request that you be so kind and merciful as to grant me through kindness to exceptionally, mercifully be permitted to listen to the radio and have a radio in my home. In the sweet and firm hope and belief that your honor, Mr. President, will be so kind and generous as to graciously acknowledge this major request and also kindly help me so that it can be graciously fulfilled. And for such willingness and kindness, I give you my warmest and sincerest gratitude in advance. The reason for my fervent wish is that several years ago I was operated on both legs and now I cannot leave home much. I'm forced to spend most of my time at home in my apartment. And this is why it would be such a gracious act and such a benefit for me if I could, given my circumstances out of compassion, 
be specially exempted from such a ban. I live only with my mother, who is already old, living on a teacher's pension, quietly and in considerable retreat from the outside world. We are loyal, politically reliable, devoted citizens of this country. We have never been punished for even the smallest inappropriate infraction, etc. I also solemnly swear that in case your kind permission is given to be allowed to listen to the radio, I would naturally limit myself to listening exclusively to those domestic broadcast stations that are authorized by the government and those of allied countries, especially the music broadcasts. I believe that your fatherly and generous heart knows the heights of its immortal worthiness and is able to offer understanding and help to those who are small and weak, who trustfully run to its protective wings. And I feel very fortunate to be there because I know that I will not be forsaken in my request. Reiterating my earnest plea, I hope rather firmly believe that this request will be kindly, benevolently, and graciously granted in a favorable way. And in this hope, I express my full and most humble respect. And then he signed it. Um, what happened with his letter is that the office of the president sent a note to him and to the district office saying that he had neglected to include an eight crown processing fee and that he should send, it was in the form of a stamp and that he should send the stamp and they would continue with uh, his request. The district office, which received a copy of the letter, wrote and said that it is no longer necessary to process this request because Tibor B and his mother were deported on May 28th, 1942. They were deported uh, to a place called Izbica in Poland. And about 10 days later, there was an action and they were taken either to uh, Belzec or Sobibor. It's not clear, but those were extermination camps and as a person who was, uh, his mother was 71 years old. She was also deported with him. As a handicapped person, upon arrival in Sobibor, he would have been taken to a cart and taken around to a place that they called the Lazaret, which was supposed to be some kind of uh, quote unquote hospital where he would be shot in the neck. His mother went through the process where um, because she was not handicapped, they were surely separated on the platform and uh, she would have had her hair cut and then be forced to undress, told she was going to take a shower and then taken to a gas chamber where she perished. So it's a very sad story indeed. Uh, the letter is very emotional. It's very obsequious and overly polite. And um, all he wanted was to be able to have a radio at home, but not having a radio isolated Jews. And it was an important part of the policy to isolate Jews socially in the Slovak state. I have another letter here written by a young woman named Adela. She was 21 years old. And because of the Jewish code, she could not be adopted. She was identified as a Jew. And that was her reason for asking for an exemption. And here is her letter. December 12th, 1941. Your Excellency, President of the Slovak Republic, I, the undersigned, an office worker in Bratislava, residing on Hermann Goering Street, devotedly ask your excellency to grant me a kindness so that I can be considered of mixed race. I justify my most respectful request to your excellency as follows. I was born on April 23rd, 1920 in Bratislava out of wedlock to Alica N who later married and became widowed to Mr. T. My father, Jan B. of Bratislava, born in Ternava, is Roman Catholic. 
He is a worker and a Slovak citizen. He was unable to marry my mother at the time. And for that reason, I was registered as, a, as being Jewish based on my mother's being Jewish. I entered the Lutheran faith on November 2 of this year and my mother did the same thing a few days later. My father wishes to adopt me and we were informed that this is not possible because I am considered 100% Jewish under the Jewish code. For this reason, I most respectfully request your excellency to kindly grant me an exemption so that I can be considered mixed. I believe that your excellency will help me so that at least now I can live with my father and have a happy family life, something that was denied to me as a child. Thank you very much, your excellency, for your special consideration. And I bow before you with the utmost respect Adela N. Adela N was deported about five weeks after she wrote her letter. She was on the second transport out of Slovakia. It was a transport of women and girls. And she went to Auschwitz and uh, she, she perished. Uh, a refusal notice went out from the president's office on January 6th, 1943 a year later. Uh, she, um, I'm sorry, I realized I just made a mistake. She was deported on March 27th, 1942, not January. Excuse me for that. Uh, there was a backlog uh, for these letters. They had far more letters than they could handle. There were only 11 staff members in that office and they handled these letters very bureaucratically and they got to them when they got to them. And she was long dead by the time that letter was sent out. Okay. Here is a letter from someone who wanted to Aryanize a Jewish property. The would-be Aryanizer was from Mitra, about an hour's drive from Bratislava, a little bit more. And he had owned a wholesale goods business. And he decided that he wanted to be a, an Aryanizer of a Jewish wholesale foods business. And he was assigned as a temporary administrator in the business. Temporary administrators went into businesses, Jewish businesses, expecting to be named, eventually named the Aryanizer. And the purpose was to learn all they could about business operations from the Jewish owner before the Jewish owner was kicked out of the business. He decided based on the fact, his name is Bartolome, decided that based on the fact that he had been named temporary administrator, that he would sell his existing wholesale goods business and focus solely on the Jewish business. He wrote that he had been assured by local leaders, party leaders and Aryanizer um, offices, that he would get this business and that he was on the top of the list of people who were going to, uh, who, who were receiving consideration. He wrote, he found out that he was not going to get the business and he wrote the following to Tiso. Now I have been notified that my application to Arianize was rejected. Why didn't they tell me that before? So I could have sold my home and my other business for a better price. I have been there at the Jewish company for over half a year. And now some simpleton who, and I, who ran the company well, I am a 20 year supporter of autonomy. So why? Because I didn't seek favoritism. I thought that an expert doesn't need favoritism. And I would have taken the business over 100%. I don't understand this. And what should I do now that I have been tossed onto the pavement? Should I complain that I have been deprived of bread? I ran that business well. I wrote all the necessary reports, so why? Isn't this an injustice that flies high to the sky? And uh, Tiso's office investigated. They wrote to the powers that be asking why Bartolome did not receive the Jewish property that he wanted. And they wrote back and said he was never a serious contender because he's not a member of the party and that he was Hungarian. 
So the person who had promised him uh, that he would Aryanize the business uh, either didn't have the authority to say that or something changed when they found out about his ethnicity and his party affiliation. So on to the next letter. A non-Jewish public servant with a Jewish spouse that I mentioned earlier. These people were supposed to lose their jobs. Karolje was a notary's assistant in Sechovska Polyanka in the eastern part of Slovakia. And when he found out that he was going to be fired from his job, he also wrote to Tiso to ask for an exemption. And here is what he wrote, in case you cannot read it, I'll read it for you. I, the October 27th, 1941, I, the undersigned, Karol Jö, assistant notary in Sechovska Polyanka in the Varanov Natoplo district, turn to you with the following most respectful request. I have been employed as an office assistant in the notary's office in a permanent position. Due to a lack of opportunities, on May 11th, 1935, I married a Jewess named Shadol Taef. On June 16th, 1939, a child was born of this marriage named Mila. I am a Lutheran and on February 2nd, 1939, my wife left the Jewish faith and joined the Lutheran church. Our daughter is also a Lutheran. This makes me the non-Jewish spouse of a Jew as described in paragraph 15 of the Jewish code and I'm therefore barred from remaining a public servant. I respectfully request for the kindness of releasing me from this provision in accordance with paragraph 255. I am very poor and have no other property outside of my employment as a notary's assistant. My wife is also poor and our three member family lives modestly on my salary. Since our wedding, my wife has had no contact with any members of her family or with other Jews and we live on our own in a separate building. I'm a quiet and undemanding worker who carries out my duties faithfully, which I can prove if desired. I have never been involved in politics. I was not affiliated with the previous regime and I'm a proper party member. I've always been and always will be a good Slovak. I've never in any way in thought or in deed acted against the Slovak state. If not for the child, I would divorce my wife but my daughter would be without a mother or anyone to look after her. Based on the situation I've described, I politely request, since my existence and that of my small child are at stake, whom I love very much, and I cannot imagine my life without her, that I should be freed from this provision and remain employed in my current position and continue with my modest and conscientious work so that I can support my family. Uh, this letter, this file had two additional letters. One of the letters was from a person who's not identified and who explains that it's true, um, this man's wife was Jewish, but she converted and she carries out all of her religious responsibilities and she goes to church. And the other letter says the exact opposite that um, his wife is a Jew, she's never been seen in a church, and uh, no one knows whether she can be trusted or not because she is a Jew herself. Uh, the way things turned out in these cases was that about six months later, another law came out that said that any non-Jewish person who was harmed financially by anti-Jewish legislation will not be harmed. Whether this man was able to hold on to his job for another six months, I wasn't able to find out. I wasn't able to find out what happened to him or his wife or their child. So that, um, I should also mention this category of letters is very small. So far, I've only found four of them, but I feel that they're very poignant and when somebody is scared and worried, they will say anything. And so I hesitate to judge this man for saying that he chose his wife because there was no one else to marry and he would divorce her, but he needs her to raise their child. I think that 
one of the things that I've learned when reading these letters is that people will say what they feel they need to say in order to persuade. And that was what the main purpose of these letters was. So I thought it would be interesting for me to read it to you. Also, I've had a lot of questions from people who wanted to know how priests reacted to what was going on. And it's for a different conversation, but I can tell you that I saw letters where people wanted to be helpful to specific Jews who were asking for an exemption. I never saw a letter saying that this is not a good policy, but they wrote in support of individual Jews. I saw letters where uh, priests suggested who should be allowed to Aryanize Jewish property so that not only the rich can receive Jewish properties through Aryanization. And in my book, there's a letter from a Lutheran priest who gave out uh, false baptism certificates and he was arrested and he wrote to Tiso to ask for his release. So there are many different kinds of letters from many different people. And I found a letter in a file for a young woman named Alica. She was from Pieszczeny, it's a spa town about an hour from Bratislava. She was 23 years old and she wrote to Tiso two times. Her first letter says that she had converted to Lutheranism but because she was now identified as a Jew by the Jewish code, she could no longer marry her fiance because it was forbidden for Jews and Aryans to marry. And she wrote saying, my future life rests and my happiness rests in your hands. Please grant me an exemption. Five months later, she hadn't heard back from him and she wrote them again. But this time her letter was different because she doesn't mention the fiance. She only says that her parents are becoming sicker and weaker and they're totally dependent on her for everything, uh, for all of their support. And they sacrificed so much for her that she wanted to take care of her parents in their hour of need. She also told Tiso that her father sits around in the apartment all day and oppresses them and that her mother could not handle stress because of a previous illness and she was worried about them and asked again for an exemption. And this time she put a letter from her priest in along with her letter. And this is what I will read to you now. April 16th, 1942, affidavit. The undersigned of the Verbal Bay Parish officially and truthfully states that Miss Alitza H. of Pieszczeny, born on June 6, 1918, upon proving her departure from the Israelite faith, studied Lutheran Christian religion, and on August 2, 1941, was baptized in the Verbal Bay Church. Since then, Alitza H. has served as a proper member of the Lutheran Church with all of the rights and responsibilities that entails. She carries out her church-related responsibilities faithfully. She lives a moral life, and there are no objections from the church regarding granting her an exemption, especially since her parents are totally dependent on her to support them and on her job. Her parents are elderly, and she supports them financially. It is in the social and humanitarian interest that when a child supports her parents who need her, that we recommend she receive an exemption so that she can work and mix among us Christians. Um, Alitza was eventually deported, but I don't have much information. I, I only know that she survived. Uh, her name shows up on some records, but her parents were both deported to Auschwitz at the end of July and they both perished immediately. Uh, that is all of the information I was able to find for her. Uh, I'm guessing that she married after the war and changed her name because I was never able to find any additional traces of her. That is the last letter that I have for you. Um, I just wanted to let you know why I do this and take any questions you might have. I wanted people to understand what I saw in these letters and that the type of real suffering that Slovak Jews experienced under the regime of the Slovak state 
I wanted to find out what happened to these people and humanize the history for people um, who might be interested in what happened. I believe that our knowledge of the Holocaust is not complete. If we don't know what happened in Slovakia, it feels like my life mission. And uh, as we said before, it's a, it's a um, sensitive topic that remains sensitive to this day. There are two narratives, uh, one basically stating that uh, Tiso was a martyr who saved tens of thousands of Jews. And the other narrative is that he was a murderer who murdered, sent uh, 58,000 of his own citizens um, and deported them and sent them to their deaths. Uh, and it feels very important to me to continue in my research. Uh, and I always uh, tell people that the Holocaust was a tragedy for a jury, but it was also a tragedy of the societies uh, where they lived. It was a breakdown, a moral breakdown that happened all over Europe, not just in Slovakia. And uh, I am ready to take any questions that there might be. Uh, this photo is uh, showing that Jews, letters pertaining to Jews needed to be indicated as such that it was a Jewish matter. It made the letters stand out. So uh, it was a further humiliation. It subjected Jews to additional scrutiny. And it was something that even the Nazis didn't think of. But it's a specific aspect of uh, anti-Jewish persecution in Slovakia. Thank you very much for being here. And I would like to take any questions that there might be. Madeleine, thank you very much for your showing us the letters, talking about them. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the Bohemian uh, Benevolent and Literary Association for co-sponsoring and supporting this program, as well as Leo Beck Institute, who spread the word about tonight. Uh, Madeline is fluent both in English and in Slovak. Please submit your questions. I think our Zoom master is Pavla. So if you submit the questions, Madeline will answer. And if you have more questions, we, uh, there is an email address to her. You can contact her there. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I, I would like to add my uh, deepest thanks, Madeleine, for your incredible presentation. It's uh, so important and moving and um, so crucial to look back, to be able to, um, to amend some, to, to improve some things that happened in the past or to, um, to forgive, to reconciliate things. And uh, so I think this is an incredible research and um, I can imagine that um, it, it becomes an obsession for you and then your life mission. Thank you so much for doing that. Before I uh, move to questions that are piling up here, um, I just wanted to ask you, is, uh, is there, do you know if there's any other collection of letters uh, around the world or in other countries that are, uh, that people wrote uh, in desire to save their fellow citizens or themselves to during the war? Uh, this topic of entreaties or petitions is something that has not been studied extensively before. And there is a book that just came out last July. It's from Berghand Books. And uh, it's written by Wolf Gruner and Thomas Pegalo Kaplan. And I apologize, like the name, I'm blanking out on the name, but uh, it's, uh, it's a fascinating book and it talks about letters that Jews wrote from Germany, uh, Bohemia, Moravia, uh, Hungary, Romania. And it, basically it looks at the phenomenon of petition writing and why it's important to bring them into the historical narrative. Uh, and I, I want also to do this for Slovakia. And after I saw the book, I wrote to the authors and I said, if you ever do another volume, it would be nice to include the letters to Tiso in, in a future text. 
I don't think they're planning on doing that, but if they ever do, they said they would get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I will read the questions that I see here. And uh, so the first one, uh, one um, of our guests writes, very curious to know about any progress related to the taboo referred to by Eva Derman in the introduction, in addition to the book's rating in literature related forum. Uh, the taboo of speaking studying and writing about the Holocaust is due to communist censorship in the post-war government. And it's actually caused a serious problem because basically two generations of people don't know their own history. And it's a troubling history and we all have, all, all countries struggle, I think, to look at the darker aspects of their history. Uh, but this process was truncated or cut off and it really wasn't uh, brought back in, into the historical narrative at all until 1989 after the Velvet Re Revolution. Uh, this makes the field of Holocaust studies in Slovakia very new. And there's a large information gap um, I am working on a project. I got a grant from the U.S. Embassy in Bratislava to bring the letters into high school, middle school uh, classrooms so that uh, younger people can learn about the letters and the warnings inside the letters about um, hatred, nationalism, and, and tolerance. Uh, that project should be completed by the end of this year. Uh, there is progress. Slovak Holocaust historians are fabulous and they've mapped out this history very thoroughly. It just took some time to get around to the work that I'm doing because that historical context needed to be put together first. Um, then uh, one person asks, where exceptions only for individuals or also for small immediate family groups? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that before. Anyone who received a, an exemption, it included them and their immediate family members. So if TSO gave out 922 exemptions, when you include all of the family members, that's between four and 5,000 people. Would, what could have Tibor B have meant by politically reliable? That they had never been put in prison for political reasons and that they were not, uh, they didn't agitate against the regime, that they uh, were, that they led politically correct lives under this regime and that they were loyal. Did Tiso's office show any preference for exemption based on the region of Slovakia, West versus Central versus East, city versus town? Perhaps uh, more so for the area of his origin? Actually, the people who came from where he came from, which is uh, Belka, Icha, uh, all of the Jews in that town uh, were deported except for the few who got away and emigrated beforehand. The further east you went, the fewer exemptions were awarded. This corresponds with the fact that the further east you went, the less rich the Jews were. The people who tended to get exemptions were well off financially, they were around 40 years old and they had something that they could contribute to the Slovak economy. The further east you went, there, the more poverty there was and the less likelihood that an exemption would be awarded. And it's very interesting because when I look at these letters and I hold them in my hands, I see that somebody read them in the president's office and underlined the things that they thought were relevant. And whenever anybody wrote that they were poor, it was underlined. Uh, so looking at a person's financial situation was very important. And when they investigated people who applied for exemptions, they always asked 
what are the financial holdings of this person and how much are they capable of paying if they get an exemption? Miriam Klein Kasanov writes, I'm from Kosice, escaped in 1941. Thank you for joining us. That's wonderful. Uh, Susanna Justman asks, did Tiso see any of these letters? Yes, yes, he did. Um, he did not see all of these letters. And when he had his trial after the war, he testified that he had seen them all. But that was, I don't actually believe that because there were so many of them. He did see some of them, um, I have learned to recognize his handwriting and I could see notes that he made on the letters themselves. Um, it was, the Jewish question was the largest question of the society at the time. The anti-Jewish legislation was the largest body of legislation in the country at the time. So it would make sense that he would monitor exemption requests. How many of them he saw, I'll never know. Um, he didn't write on all of them. Sometimes uh, there are just uh, three letters, zap, meaning uh, reject, and they look like his handwriting, but I'm not 100% sure. But he did see, he must have seen um, hundreds of them. He may not have seen them all though. I, I find that hard to believe. Tiso is now buried in a canonical crypt in a Catholic cathedral in Nitra. Does that mean he was forgiven by the Catholic Church? I do not know the answer to that question at all. Um, I've never investigated that, I'm sorry. Then we have a um, comment from Fred Schenfeld. I survived the Holocaust in Slovakia by hiding in the woods. My father had an exception because of his business. Uh, uh, Mark Hancock asks, how many of the 20,000 letters have you seen so far? And how many do you expect to review? I don't believe my research is finished. I've probably seen somewhere between two and 3,000 of these letters. Uh, if you consider all of the letters in the files. Uh, as far as letters to Tiso directly without the other letters in the files, I would say about a thousand. The archive lets me have three boxes a day. And um, sometimes the box will be full of interesting materials for my studies. And sometimes there won't be anything in the box. But um, usually by after looking through three boxes in Slovak, uh, faded letters, um, that's usually my mental limit anyway. So I think it's going to take me a little bit more time. The archive has been closed because of COVID, but it's reopened now. So I hope I can get back there and look at some more. Um, Nancy Sternberg asks, how many Jews survived in Slovakia and under what circumstances? Um, I, my understanding from history books is that six to 800 Jews survived the uh, concentration camps. I am not sure how many Jews uh, survived uh, by being in hiding. There are more incidences of hiding after the um, Germans invaded Slovakia and people whose families had exemptions uh, were mostly, not all, safe from deportation. Eva, did you have any comments? Yes, I have a question. Um, I assume that Tiso derived uh, his authority from the fact that he was priest. And I'm sure that all priests followed his uh, ideas of what to do about Jews. I mean, for example, one set of my grandparents uh, survived because it was a Catholic priest, uh, Jan Dechert, who asked the parishioners at a mass to protect the doctor. The other set of grandparents got murdered. Uh, was there any um, 
group of priests, any clergy that objected to the Jewish legislation. Uh, do, you, do you have access to church archives? I have not yet looked in church archives. Um, one of the uh, Bishop Goidich, who was a Greek Greco Catholic uh, priest bishop in um, in Prashov, was uh, given the designation of righteous among the nations for what he did to save Jews. Uh, many Jews were saved. The ones who survived survived because they hid in convents and churches. Uh, the Vatican had problems with what Tiso was doing, and they tried to put pressure on him to no avail. The first year of the deportations in 1942, the, a group of priests wrote that they wanted uh, to save the lives of converts. Then they did not object to the deportations, but a year later, they objected to them for converts and Jews because of their inhumane treatment that they received while they were still in Slovakia. And by then word had probably spread about where these people were going. It's the, the question of priests and their reactions are all over. There isn't one sentence I can say that characterizes their reactions. There were, I saw a letter from a priest who recommended someone receive an exemption because he had Aryanized her family's home and they couldn't pay the rent unless she got a, a job and she couldn't get a job if she didn't have an exemption. On the other hand, uh, the man who I referred to earlier from Banska Bistrica, Daniel Kovac, he was a Lutheran priest and he was put in prison because they found out that he was falsifying um, baptism certificates and he wrote that he knew of the killings of Jews and uh, he did not want to have their blood on his hands. So the reactions are all over the place. It's not possible to put priests in, at least so far from what I can see, in a specific group of people who reacted as a specific way. Like all human beings, uh, they made decisions about how they felt on an individual basis, just the way everyone else in the society did. At least that's my, that's my view. We have more questions here. Um, did any Jews ask to be exempt from deportation? Uh, there was only one letter which I saw that specifically mentioned deportations. It was a man named Josef M from Bratislava and he said, if you send us to the former Ukraine and to uh, occupied Poland, a ready-made slaughter awaits us. We would be happy if you just shut us here at home. Uh, other than that, uh, most of these letters were written before the idea of gas chambers had occurred to anyone, well before the, the even before the deportations began. Jews wrote because they were frightened about their future because of all of the persecution and the anti-Semitic nature of all of the legislation, the decrees, the ordinances. They had no idea where things were headed. And this is part of um, what makes studying this material so important. Most testimonies and most conversations around the deportations take place concerning when the deportations take play, took place, but the persecution began well before. And so the Holocaust doesn't begin with people being put into cattle cars. It begins with the first piece of legislation designed to uh, harm the country's Jewish population. People wrote to him because they were scared. They didn't write to him because they knew that if they they, because they knew that they were, things were leading to their death. We also, of course, um, receive uh, wonderful comments on your lecture from Amira Kontratner. Thank you for this compelling and prof profoundly sad presentation. 
Um, then there's the question, wasn't Tiso as someone somewhat of a nationalist concerned with independence for his small country while pressured by his VIP, uh, who was an ardent anti-Semite? Pressured by whom? By his VIP, VP, VP, sorry, VP. Oh, there were other forces in the government that were supposedly more radical than Tiso was. Uh, that's a that's a really interesting question. Did I understand the question correctly that he was forced to do whether he was well, wasn't Tiso as somewhat of a nationalist concerned with independence for his small country while pressured by his VP was an ardent anti-Semite. Um, okay, so yeah, now I understand the question. Um, I believe this is my own personal conclusion after all the things that I've read that Tiso was so interested in Slovak independence that he was willing to trade away the lives of some of his countrymen when the opportunity, when it was presented that way. Um, politicians, when Czechoslovakia was being split up, let people like Goering and Hitler know that if they were given a state, they would solve the Jewish problem using the Nuremberg laws as their guide. And so I sort of see it that way. Uh, Tiso did have nationalist sentiments, but not always. I highly recommend a book by James Ward. It's a biography of Joseph Tiso that talks about all the early influences in his life that shaped him. Uh, it's called um, Priest, Collaborator, Josef Tiso and the Making of Fascist Slovakia. If that's not the exact title, I'm very close. Uh, it's an excellent book. It's thoroughly researched and uh, his anti-Semitic leanings and his nationalism and his interest in an in independent Slovakia are very, very well mapped out in that book. Uh, Jana Riley asked, uh, my grandparents lived in Slovakia during this time. Did you know of any Gentiles who helped Jews escape Slovakia? My grandparents smuggled Jews out of the area around Bratislava and never was able to find more info. Have you found any documentation in the archives? I've seen no documentation. I'm aware that um, many Jews in Slovakia went into Hungary. I even know about some Jews who went into Poland, even though it was Nazi occupied, but near the borderlands, which were pretty far away from the capital of the country. I have not seen anything about that in the group of records that I'm looking at. Uh, from Mel Barenholtz, what is the basis, if any, for the claim that Tiso saved Jews? Oh, yes, this is the issue that's so sensitive. Um, people who would like to exculpate him from responsibility for the deportations state that he saved 10, 20, 30, 40,000 Jews, which is simply the numbers are simply impossible. Um, and some people go so far as to say that the Jews provoked the Slovak national uprising and had the uprising not taken place, those 30, 40,000 Jews would have survived the Holocaust. Um, this is not something that is borne out by archival evidence. There's nothing in the files to indicate that this is true. Uh, there is a document where Tiso had spoken in private with a Hungarian member of parliament. And he told this member of parliament that we have around 20,000 Jews that were not deported in 1942 by the Slovak state because they've received various kinds of exemptions. There were other exemptions other than just the presidential exemption, but he took responsibility for all of them or took credit for all of them. And he told this, um, this Hungarian member of parliament that he was so sorry that he had ever awarded exemptions and that uh, he wished there was some way to cancel them. 
Um, about, <laughs> it's, it's a sticky, it's a sticky topic. Um, they, like I said earlier, there are two narratives that he saved Jews or that he murdered Jews and they both cannot be true. So the next question is, when did the deportation start? Were they organized by Slovak state or by the Nazi Germans? Uh, the deportations began on March 25th, 1942, and the Slovak deportations ended on October 20th, 1942. They were organized by the Slovak state, but they had German advisors. I think that uh, there was a German advisor at every deportation to oversee if things were going smoothly, but it was all done under the auspices of the Slovak state. For every Jew that was transported, Slovakia paid the Germans 500 Reichsmarks in resettlement compensation, and they also paid for their train fare. Uh, so I've seen many documents where the tax office is asking for the exact numbers so that they can make their payments to the Germans. Uh, the Germans said that uh, in exchange, we will promise that the Slovak Jews will not return and Slovakia can keep all Jewish property that it confiscates. That was the deal that they made. And later on, a group of parliamentarians who were concerned about, oh, and that the Slovaks needed to strip them of their citizenship. And later on, when there were some concerns about how the these deportations looked that they were cruel and that the people were the Jews were being treated terribly and mercilessly uh, on while they were still on Slovak soil and then they were deported. They wanted to do a they wanted to go to Poland and see where these Jews were. And the answer that they got from the Nazis was why they're not your citizens you took their citizenship away so there's no point in you going to see people who are not citizens of your country but that was the deal they made um there's another uh, common question fascinating research i'm interested how originally the letters got to the museum who submitted them well once i found them i worked with people who copied them on microfilm. It was, shows you how long ago this was. And these copies went to the museum and they're there for anybody who wants to research them. That's, that's another question actually. Have you created a database of the letters that are cross-referenced by name city? Is this available to the public? I have a let, I have a, my own Excel spreadsheet uh, of the letters that I've looked at and the topics in the letters and the cities because I wanted to look at the demographics of the letter writers. But as far as I know, uh, there's no, you can go to the website of um, the Institute for Public Memory, which is ustapametinaroda.gov and uh, there is information there you have to look for it. If the person who asked this question is trying to find out about a relative or somebody that they knew, you should feel free to send me an email. And if I've seen their name, I will let you know. It's harder when somebody says, would you look for somebody? Because the um, inventory of records in that office is woefully incomplete. In some record groups, you'll find like a name register or a place register. But it was such a hot potato when they were putting together the finding aids for this group of records that the finding aid is only 17 pages long and about half of those pages are just background information. The finding aid was made in 1961 uh, under communism at a time when they really didn't want to discuss uh, anything related to TISO or the Holocaust. But anybody who, um, I really do welcome emails. Um, my email address is mdadkurti at hotmail.com. And uh, if you'd like to read more about my work in English, I have a couple of articles that I can email back uh, or any questions that don't get covered this evening or questions about specific people. Nine times out of 10, when it comes to specific people, I disappoint. 
because I don't have the information, but you never know. If I have it, I'll give it. Also, when, uh, when we send information about the link for this talk on YouTube, we can include your email address. If Absolutely. It's... Absolutely. Um, and then uh, Dr. Joseph Yaksi from Bratislava was Tiso's personal physician. He saved many Jews in this in that capacity under Tiso's nose and also used his relationship with Tiso to save Jews. I brought this to the attention of Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Museum. You may have seen the research that I did in this area as well, and that's by Amira Kontratner. Uh, I have not seen it, but I would like to. Uh, if there's a way to email me information, I can check both at the museum and at Yad Vashem. And this is from Gary Weissman. Hi, Madeline, great talk. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about responses to your work from what you experienced at schools you've visited to what you've seen in media coverage. Okay, well, Gary Weissman is one of my professors. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for your question. Uh, it's very interesting, the reactions that I get from students. Uh, a lot of what we think about a lot of what people think about this two-tiered uh, debate that I mentioned earlier depends on what a person has heard around their own dinner table. And Slovakia was a Nazi client state and uh, these people are their grandchildren. And uh, they have heard different stories. They've heard different stories at school and different stories at home. I think it's a very difficult position for a young person to be in, frankly. The response I get from students is usually that they're very, very interested and they want to know more. And sometimes I, I have had people stand up and tell me that um, it's all a lie, it never happened. And these are school kids who have gone on visits to, um, to Auschwitz because Auschwitz is only a five or six hour drive from most places in Slovakia and sometimes, and sometimes it's even closer. Uh, this uh, knowledge gap is, it's taking a long time to close it. Uh, the total amount of schooling on World War II is three hours for all of World War II in junior year. And, it, and that's supposed to include the Holocaust. It's really not enough time. Teachers who have an interest in the topic have the option of presenting more information. And those are the people that um, I tend to work with and they devote a lot of time uh, explaining. Uh, I have seen all different kinds of reactions from students. I've seen uh, students cry when I read some of the letters. I usually read letters written by people in their age group. I try to uh, explain to them what the loss of freedom must have felt like at the time. Uh, I tried to liken it to not being able to have internet or cell phone to try to make it more relevant. But most of the reactions are that they're curious. But I think that that might be because the teachers who invite us in are curious themselves and they work with their students. One time I was supposed to visit a school and a teachers suggested that there were technical problems and that I shouldn't go there. It only happened to me once. Then uh, we have a comment from Rosie Kovacdi. I'm from Hungary, very similar situation with Admira Horthy. Um, Will the names, anonymous attendee, will the names of the letter writers and family members be indexed? Be what? If they will be index, indexed? Indexed. Um, I don't know that it's possible to index them all because of the their vast number. I know people would like to research by name. Uh, my collection is very small uh, compared to the number of actual letters in the archive. I don't know that they'll ever be indexed. I wish that these discoveries had been made at a time when it was possible to search documents online. 
but these copies were made on microfilm and they've never been digitized. Maybe one day, uh, but not yet. And this is a personal question for you. How did you take care of yourself while you were researching such emotionally difficult material? And that's ah. <laughs> yeah, it is emotionally difficult. And there were times when I would be looking at documents and I would realize that, um, that I had tears on my face and I didn't even notice it. Um, there were times when I uh, was very upset. Sometimes I was angry. Sometimes I was sad. Um, and finally, I just came to the conclusion that my discomfort is a small price to pay so that the information can come out because it's vitally important information from my viewpoint and that the work I do helps um, honor the victims and also helps us to remember them so that they're not just a piece of paper in an archive on a hill, but real people, people who are just like us, who had hopes and dreams and families and who were suffered just for their origins. And uh, so if I get upset, I remind myself why I'm doing this and it, it's, I'm calmer. But uh, there have been times when it's been extremely difficult. When I'm, when I'm researching the fate of somebody, I have a like sixth sense of when I'm getting close to finding out whether the person survived or not. And I get very agitated and I do like figure eights at home, uh, walking until I um, expend enough energy to be able to sit and look. And um, I'm always hoping that the person survived, but my joy is short lived because uh, I remember, I remind myself that this person was persecuted and lost loved ones and lived in fear and suffered. But yeah, it's very emotional. Uh, it's very difficult material, but it's, it feels important to do. Uh, Susan Leidemann uh, writes, as best as I know, there was a Papal Nuncio who interv intervened in late 1942 and deportations ceased for a time until the Slovak national uprising. Have you looked at the objections of the Lutheran church to the deportation of Jews? There were objections. The person that I think the questioner is referring to is Papal Nun Nuncio Borzio from the Vatican who went to Tiso. I'm not 100% sure when he went to him and said, this is inhumane and what you're doing is wrong and it's out of line and out of step with church teachings. And Tiso denied it. And he said, no, that's not true. These people are just going to work just like any other Slovaks going to Germany to work. And it was a patent lie. And, uh, the, and the nuncio wrote back to the Vatican saying, there's no talking with this person. He, he doesn't tell the truth and he can't be convinced to stop. Whether it was church pressure that halted the deportations at the end of October uh, 1942 or other pressures is not known. However, by early 1943, after the fall of the Germans in Stalingrad, the Slovak government realized that Germany may not win the war. So geopolitics may also be a reason why the deportations halted. And they were only taken up again in the fall of 1944 after the Nazis invaded Slovakia. When people talk about pressures to uh, resume the deportations and the fact that the Slovak government resisted them, it's actually proof that they did not resist them in 1942 uh, when the Nazis were on top of things geopolitically. There were pressures from Nazi Germany to resume the deportations and the Slovaks, uh, the Slovaks resisted them. The German ambassador moved into Slovakia wrote and said the deportations are not very popular with the Slovak population. And there are so many people here with exemptions that um, not really sure how we can proceed. Somebody from inside Tiso's own government, uh, Tuka, wrote to um, von Ribbentrop, the foreign minister of Germany, and, and said, you really should write and tell 
TESOL to resume the deportations. So right from inside the government. It's all very complicated and there's a lot of history there, but the Slovak government resisted. And finally the Nazis deported roughly 13,000 more people on their own power without Slovak help. And a lot of Slovaks, uh, Slovak Jews were shot on site in Slovakia. They weren't even deported and their bodies are in mass graves in Slovakia. Uh, Professor uh, Jindrich Teman asks, uh, was the issue of exemptions mentioned in Tiso's trial? Yes, uh, yes it was. Um, he said that he was the person responsible for everything related to the exemptions, which I also don't believe because he didn't see the thousands and thousands and thousands. He did sign the ones that were approved and he did decide how much those people should pay. Sometimes they didn't have to pay anything. I also heard that there was a bill, which I haven't found yet, for 100,000 crowns, which is the highest bill that I've heard of. But uh, he claimed in the trial that uh, he was the only person. The man who was the chief of staff, Neumann, uh, Anton Neumann, who worked in the president's office, was on trial as well. And it looks to me like Tiso was trying to help exonerate Neumann, who in the end was not imprisoned for the role he played. They claimed that he was apolitical, which is um, hard for me to, to believe. But that's how he got off. Uh, we have a comment and a question from Eva Bell. Thank you for sharing all your findings and knowledge. I read the book, very sad, but interesting reading. What other exemptions and who could grant them? Oh, there were exemptions from many different ministries. I think that the most, um, they, they could come from the Ministry of the Interior and they could also come from uh, work exemptions, work-related exemptions came from the Ministry of Economy. I believe that the Ministry of Education also granted exemptions and that the minister actually helped some Jews that way, but I don't know much more information about that. But the most coveted exemption was the presidential exemption because it was believed that it could stabilize your situation and help avoid deportation. Uh, Barbara Spaventa asks, of the 18,000 that were given exemptions, how many survived the war? That is a hard number to estimate. Um, of the ones who received exemptions, there were people who were hidden. Uh, there were people who um, lived under false identities. I don't know the total. But there were those were the different main ways that people survived in Slovakia. Um, what were the conditions for Jews in between the stop of deportations in October 1942 and the Slovak national uprising? Um, conditions were tough because the Jewish code was still in force. Um, there was less and less interest in Aryanization because most everything had been Aryanized already and people were very upset with the Aryanization process. They thought that it was going to even out some social inequities in the country. And instead it just turned out to be for protégés of the regime and there was a lot of favoritism and corruption. And uh, so there was less and less interest in that. Um, the, otherwise, the situation in terms of um, whether or not you still had to wear a Jewish star in your clothes or how you were allowed to uh, travel and, and other such things, um, they remained in force. I think we basically came to the end of the questions. We there, Maybe I 
didn't ask all of them. Some of them were overlapping. But um, as I said before, uh, we are recording your presentation. And when we send to everyone the information about the link to YouTube, we will also include your email address with your permission. And uh, people will be able to, um, to get in touch with you personally. Thank you very Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who has joined us uh, this evening, afternoon, and uh, Madeleine, uh, good luck with all your, with PhD, your professor, yes. and uh, all this incredibly important research that you've been doing on behalf of all of us. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.